Thank you for downloading this Real Agriculture podcast. Excite your crops with inputs from Excite Bio. Access nitrogen and phosphorus with Excite Bio's lineup of inoculants and ag biologicals. Since 2010, they've been helping farmers harness the power of the soil. Learn more at excitebio.ca. That's X I T E B I O.ca. For Real Agriculture, I'm Kelvin Hepner at Crop Connect in Winnipeg and pleased to be joined now by Chris Vervates, Executive Director of the Canadian Oilseed Processors Association. And Chris, it's been a few months, well, over a year now since I think we last talked and did an update on where things are at with all of the new canola crush processing capacity uh, coming on stream in Western Canada. Can you bring us up to speed on, uh, on that capacity, that increase that in demand for uh, ultimately for canola grown on the prairies? Yeah, so I think the last time we met Calvin was almost a year ago to the day um, in Brandon. Um, so there is um, three of the five announcements for expanded crush that have been made over the last uh, three or four years are under construction. They're at various stages of construction, um, but that would represent in total roughly three to three and a half million tons of additional capacity that'll come on once those plants are complete in uh, the years ahead. What's that in terms of percentage uh, versus current demand or yeah, existing demand. so that would be approximately an increase of 30 percent of okay. capacity compared to where we are today okay. and that one i know one is still up in the air because there is a, a an acquisition or a merger that's underway as well so i guess that that one is probably still under review yeah i think that's right i think that's the right way to categorize that particular facility that it is still being reviewed okay so what does this mean in terms of uh, timeline for when this demand is going to come on stream? And of course, there's been lots of discussion about what that means for where Canadian canola goes, whether it goes to export markets or stays domestic. Yeah, I think when we see some of this capacity coming online in the months and years ahead, I'd like to think that it's a very exciting time for the industry, again, to have that value-added processing to take place here in Canada. Um, export markets are still going to be a big part of the equation, right? So we often think, okay, so this is all going to be staying in our own backyard. We can't lose sight of the fact that a lot of our canola oil ends up in the export market. Um, think about the United States as really being one of those key markets, not just in terms of our traditional market for canola oil, it's also our fastest growing market owing to the boom in biofuel demand in the United States. And then we can't think or we can't lose sight of canola meal. We're going to have a lot more canola meal that is going to be coming into the marketplace. And we think that marketplace in terms of more canola meal is offshore. So exports are still, again, a really big part of the equation. Okay. Are we making progress in terms of uh, connecting some of those dots and figuring out what that picture might look like for some of those other components? Yeah, I think we are. I mean, and, and really kudos to the Canola Council of Canada and the value chain's efforts to try to diversify some of our markets offshore, in particular for meal. Again, this is the big question that's looming over the industry. Where are we going to find a home for this meal? And I can tell you that the Canola Council is on it. Okay. Say I'm a, a customer from Japan. I've always bought X number of, uh, I guess, I don't know, is it in liters? Uh, quantity, X quantity of, uh, of canola oil from Canada, and I've been a reliable, consistent supplier yeah. or purchaser, and you've been, likewise, Canada's been a reliable, consistent supplier. What does this mean for that relationship, having this increased demand for canola processing domestically here in Canada? Yeah, I think there's a balance there, right? So we are going to see more seed move into value-added processing here in Canada. This is something we've always wanted. So to see it start to take shape is really a big benefit and a big... Um, opportunity for our entire value chain. That doesn't mean that we won't have seed for sale. I think that's a bit of a misnomer where folks feel like there's not going to be any seed left to export or to ship to traditional markets like Japan. I think there is going to be a balance there where we will continue as a canola industry to be able to sell to those traditional markets. Okay. Yeah, I guess Japan would buy as seed, not as oil. I mean, that's correct, yeah. yes. Yeah. So We've also seen investment, of course, in soybean processing in North America as well, including not far across the border uh, from here in, in southern Manitoba. What does that impact, or how, is, how does that affect future demand for canola oil if we're also seeing all this uh, other oilseed uh, processing coming on stream? Yeah, there's going to be a lot more feedstock available for the growing biofuel industry in North America. Um, as we see the biofuel market continue to grow, we believe that the supply needs to be there, whether it's going to be from soy crush or canola crush. The biofuel demand, in our opinion, in the years ahead is going to be able to um, 
basically satisfy that supply that is coming online. Okay. We've also seen investment announcements in sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, airlines certainly are interested in it, and we're seeing processors announcing processing facilities or looking at least at, at studies to build processing facilities, for example, at Portage La Prairie here down the highway from, from Winnipeg. Uh, is that picture also becoming clear in terms of what SAF demand could look like? I think it is. Um, my opinion is that the sustainable aviation fuel might still have a few years to develop, but it is becoming clear. And I think that example of Azure um, being announced in southern Manitoba as a possible plant to produce sustainable aviation fuel speaks to the fact that things are starting to crystallize on SAF. Again, maybe a few more years uh, down the road before we see some of that production capacity to come online, but the opportunities are really Again, pardon the pun here, but sky's the limit. <laughs> is renewable diesel further advanced in term, or mature in terms of knowing what that demand is going to look like? I think it is. And the primary reason that it is more mature is when we talk about some of the different biofuel programs that exist, um, whether it's the clean fuel regulation, the low carbon fuel standard in California. Um, these have always been centered on road transportation. Um, there's room for sustainable aviation fuel um, in some of these programs. British Columbia is a perfect example where we start to see programs um, putting mandates in place for blending and for carbon intensity reductions for jet fuel. But again, they're not as far along as the renewable diesel markets are. Okay. What's the early word on how the clean fuel regulation implementation last summer uh, it's now, I guess, nine, three quarters of a year kind of uh, that it's been in effect. What are we seeing in terms of demand? And is it coming from Canadian uh, sources or, or is there room for more Canadian supply to, to help meet that demand? Yeah, great question. Um, we hope to see some more visibility on the dynamics of that market soon. Um, so similar to some of the other biofuel markets that exist, again, using California as the example, they will publish a lot of data and information on the credits that are earned and what type of feedstocks are being used in those markets places. We haven't seen that yet uh, from uh, the clean fuel regulation. We hope to see that soon. But implementation overall, um, the supply chain is starting to sort things out. Um, the Canola Council of Canada, COPA, and the broader Canola family, including the CCGA and the provincial commissions, are actually hosting an informational webinar next week where we're going to really dive into some of the specifics of how a farmer um, and the rest of the supply chain can participate in the clean fuel regulation. Okay. I guess also south of the border we're also seeing different EPA decisions on, on where canola potentially fits as a, a feedstock. Can you bring us up to speed on, on that process as well? I'm assuming COPA has also uh, at least been involved as a, in the comment period on some of that. Yeah. Activity in the United States really continues to be a top priority because of how large that market is and how large we think that market is going to be going forward. And again, it's all based on policy and different incentives. Um, one of our key items that we're focusing on at the moment in the United States is the IRA tax incentives, the carbon intensity uh, of canola. These are all important pieces that uh, we are working on. Thanks for the update today, Chris, and we'll stay tuned to see where, uh, where this all unfolds in the coming years. Great. My pleasure. Thanks.